Hi, everyone. My name is Celine. I'm the founder of Flowly. We're a mobile app for chronic pain and anxiety management. And as some of you know, Flowly teaches users how to control their heart rate and their breathing to better manage their nervous system. With everything that's going on with COVID-19, with the Black Lives Matter movement, we have been trying to figure out ways that we can step up. And we wanted to take this opportunity to amplify Black voices in the invisible illness community. And so some of you might have seen our previous interviews in this series. But today, I'm super excited to introduce Amanda. Amanda is a lifestyle blogger, model, and actress living and working in London. And Amanda is a chronic illness warrior and has been diagnosed with Hashimoto's and Lyme disease. She's joining us today to share her story, and I'm really excited to have her. Thanks for being here, Amanda. Thanks for having me. So I wanted to start sort of at the beginning of your journey with your chronic illness. Um, Mm. Maybe if you could share with people about You know, when was the first time you experienced Hashimoto's or Lyme disease symptoms? And what was that journey like with those symptoms and then resulting in the diagnosis? How long did that take? What was that experience? Mm. So it was a really long journey for me from symptoms to diagnosis. So I only really just got diagnosed in 20, end of 2017, beginning of 2018. So it's been about three years. Um, But I was experiencing a lot of symptoms for years. So I was getting a lot of um, like chronic pain, inflammation. I had brain fog. I constantly felt exhausted and I had no idea like why that was. So I went from being a very active person to just not even being able to get out of bed in the morning. From that, there was like a lot of back and forth, like, you know, going to the doctor saying, hey, I think something's wrong. You know, like I'm having hot flushes in the middle of the night and I'm a 20-something-year-old woman. So yeah, I only know hot flushes from when I saw my mom go through menopause. So I was like a little worried. And then my doctor said, oh, no, like, you know, it's it's probably nothing. Like we'll do some blood tests and check for diabetes and that that's it. From then, because all my symptoms were not getting better, I just seemed to be getting worse. And feeling like, um, okay, something is definitely wrong. I'm going to the doctor and being told I'm okay, but clearly I'm not. Physically, mentally, I just feel like really bad. So it was a journey of actually having to go outside of my doctor to try and get and go privately. And then from that route, try and go like to like functional medicine before I came full circle and found out that I had Hashimoto's. And then once I found out I had Hashimoto's, got on medication, didn't get better. (laughs) Mm. So I was like, what is going on? Like, I'm still so sick. You know, like, it it didn't make any sense to me. Then we, like, started investigating even more, did more tests. Then I found out I had Lyme disease. I would say I've been having symptoms for years, but when I really actively started noticing it was about 2015. Being like, oh, right, wait, I'm not crazy. There actually is something wrong with me. It took about three and a half years. And how many doctors did you have to see in that process? Oh, oh my God. (laughs) So there was my own doctor uh, and that didn't work out because he pretty much called me a hypochondriac. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, And then I tried to go like private and even that was still like, I I wasn't getting the kind of tests. They weren't testing for the things I should have been testing for. So it was literally just generic tests, same as even with the Hashimoto's, like, they were like, oh, it might be your thyroid. We'll just test for TSH. But that's not the only marker that shows, you know, an autoimmune disease. So even with that, there was a lot of frustration because I'm like, okay, now I'm like hemorrhaging all this money. And I think I went through about three or four doctors before I started going onto forums and health forums and like yep. asking for help from people. Like, is anybody else going through this? There's a website specifically called Health Unlocked that was really, really helpful. And people were like, right, go to this person. They're a doctor, but they're the functional doctor. And then I started to get answers. That's a story we hear all the time from all of our users that they have to go through so many doctors before they get yeah. a diagnosis. and. We're going to dive into this even more later about how doctors 
just don't yeah. believe, especially their female patients. So my next question is, you are the mother of two young children. How did that change or kind of shape your experience with Hashimoto and Lyme's, like, how did you start to manage both your symptoms while also being a mother? Sort of what's your takeaway from that? Uh, I think the biggest takeaway from when I got diagnosed, because I went from being a fully functioning, very active person to just not being able to function and get out of bed, just not being able to get through the day and having such mental fog that, you know, I couldn't play with my kids. <laughs> I couldn't do the school runs as normal. I just feel like in bed. And I think it brought me full circle because it actually made me want to get better for them, for myself, but for them as well. And it pushed me to look outside of just like what the doctors tell me, you know, like the doctors like, okay, take this medicine, you should be fine. And it's not really that <laughs> clear cut. So I actually had to go within myself. I had to prioritize what's important for me. So my life completely changed. My social circles changed and my priority really just became me getting better so I can give, have a better quality of life and also just be able to be more present for my kids. Were you diagnosed when you were pregnant with your youngest child or was did the diagnosis come after you already had your children? Uh, the diagnosis actually came before I had my second child. When my son came along, he was that pregnancy was quite a surprise because prior to diagnosis, we had wanted to try for another child and I'd had, um, I didn't, I wasn't able, it just wasn't happening. I wasn't getting pregnant, you know, and I think that also kind of correlated with what was going on with like my diagnosis and my health. So he came along as, it was just a beautiful surprise. <laughs> When, we, you know, I'd kind of given up on that and I knew that getting pregnant was going to be really, really hard. But then I was now at a point where I, I completely changed my diet. I was trying to do a lot of things for myself to make myself better. So like cutting out sugar, you know, not eating any processed foods, like trying to maintain my stress levels, you know, I got into meditation and I really, truly believe that that helped. And how, how do you feel like your identity as a black woman has shaped your interactions with the healthcare system or even with doctors and nurses that you've worked with? Um, I don't think that the healthcare system is for black women, <laughs> judging from my own personal experience, because the, the hurdles that I had to jump through just to get a simple blood test, it was like shocking. Constantly not being believed when I'm going to the doctor and I'm saying, look, I think there's one time when I had so much inflammation, I almost had a hunchback and I went to the doctor and it was just like, just take some painkillers, you'll be fine. I started to think I was going crazy. That's literally how it was. And the private healthcare wasn't any different either. It was literally me being told, oh, maybe you just have a low pain threshold. Maybe you just need to relax a little bit. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, okay, this is beyond relaxing. I'm, I am suffering here. And even when I had tests done, I remember the first, first blood test I got done privately, my hormone markers, my thyroid markers were actually quite low. And I remember the doctor telling me, yeah, they're low, but they're not low enough for me to treat you. Let's wait and maybe in about six months, they'll get low enough and then we'll treat you. So I'm just like, <laughs> if you can see there's a problem, surely prevention is better. And I didn't really think there was anything racial about it. I just thought, okay, maybe that's just what it is. But then I actually have a, a really good friend who also got diagnosed with Hashimoto's around the same time as me, but she is um, a white, you know, cis woman. And she did not have the same experience. She went to her doctor and everything just went smoothly. And I don't know if this is an isolated case, but I personally have not had good experiences with being believed with, I had to beg for blood tests to be done. Like I had to go there and it was only after my friend had this test and I'd seen her blood test that she said, oh, you should ask them to test for this and this and this. So with the information from her and her experience, I would then I was able to go, not to my doctor because he still said no. <laughs> I still had to go and pay and get those tests done and then go back to my doctor and say, so look, this is what's going on. So it's been very frustrating, 
Um, I think the biggest thing is just not being told you're crazy. You know, there's nothing wrong with you. Not even being believed. I feel like not even having that foot in the door where you can actually be treated as a patient and have the doctor actually do their job. I mean, that's the, the basic of what they should be doing. I, I think it's so incredibly important, your story and your experience, because this is something we've heard, as I mentioned before, time and time again. And so first of all, women are disproportionately affected by chronic pain and a lot of chronic mm. illness conditions, and especially women of color. And when you're talking about these vulnerable populations already, and then they're also not being believed by their doctors and general practitioners and the healthcare system, it's just honestly just horrible, like the amount of effort that a lot of our patients have to go through and our users on the Flowly platform, like they tell us horrific stories of how many doctors they have to convince mm. people they have to speak to. And what I've learned is that there is a resilience in the invisible illness community because each person, while you have these common threads across chronic illness and this sort of experience, everybody has a very unique journey. And mm. But in that journey, the common theme I always hear is that the person has to become their own health advocate, right? Like it is the yeah. most single, most important thing is that you have to find sort of the resilience in yourself to empower your own voice to go and mm -hmm. seek other doctors or seek other healthcare systems or private insurance and all this just so that you can get, you know, the proper diagnosis you were entitled to in the first place. How did mm -hmm. you manage that? And how did you tell yourself, like, I'm not crazy. What I'm experiencing is real. And yeah. these people just don't understand or they're refusing to understand. How did you, mm -hmm. you know, empower yourself to do that? You know, I feel like the change was really drastic for me. You know, I was a very, very active person. You know, I was like really into fitness and working out and traveling and seeing my life and me not even be able to do something as simple as getting out of bed. You know, no matter what my doctor was telling me, I knew that I wasn't crazy. You know, like waking up in the middle of the night, drowning in my own sweat. <laughs> I was like, that's not normal. So it, I think, you know, it's, it's very, it was very discouraging. And I think it, I definitely got depressed during that, those years, just trying to get, but I knew that this wasn't normal. You know, I, I knew that. And I knew that my, this can't be my life. There's no way that this is how it's going to be for me. I have two kids, you know, I need to be there for them. You know, I want to be able to play with my son. I want to be able to go to his recitals. So Something's got to give. Like what you say, when you become your own doctor, I just had to have that determination, that resilience within me because I knew the quality of life that I wanted to have. What are some tools that you used in that journey or even now um, yeah. that help you on a daily basis, whether it's with your you know, mental health? I, I know a lot of mm -hmm. our users have anxiety, um, mm -hmm. still manage depression. Well, what are some tools that have been helpful for you? I would say the maybe the two biggest things that have been really helpful in both managing my pain and my mental well-being. The first has been my diet. I completely had to give my diet a total overhaul, cutting out sugar, cutting out processed foods, and it actually really did make a difference. The second thing was just really making time to like meditate or do anything like to reduce my stress levels. So I was never like a meditator before that, or like even just breathing, you know, I, mm -hmm. I realized once I started getting into that, that I didn't even know how to breathe, <laughs> which yep. is crazy, you know, that we're all just such shallow breathers. And like, when I'll be told, take a deep breath, I couldn't even do that. So introducing breath work and diet has really, really helped. And when I fall off, sometimes, you know, it's like Thanksgiving or it's Christmas and you go do whatever you want. I do feel it. So mm. it, it's definitely it's become a way of life. Understanding how to breathe is so critical. Mm. And that's, you know, basically the core of all our work is trying to get people to learn about their breath because it's the key to managing your unconscious system. You mentioned, like, I'm sure you're very experienced now at breath work. And that's one of the yeah. things we're just trying to educate people on. We teach people about their own resonant frequency, which is mm -hmm. the breaths per minute that each person has a different rate at. And if you figure out your rate, it's the best way to control your nervous system. For your diet, how did you, because each person is so different. I'm sure diets, mm -hmm. you know, work 
on different levels for each person. But how yeah. did you start to build your diet structure and regimen? Was it through forums you learned online? Did you work with a dietitian? Yeah. How did you kind of start to build that up for yourself? It was a mixture, to be honest. Like I, forums helped a lot. I'm not going to lie because it felt like I had to find a community, you know, like I was just so alone. And even I didn't know what autoimmune diseases were and before I had one or two. <laughs> so even with most people, like friends or family around me, they were like, what is Hashimoto's? Like, mm -hmm. what is that? Nobody know, nobody knew. So I felt like I needed to find people who know what I'm going through, who can relate. And obviously with that, then you share resources. I started looking up books and Isabella Wentz is like really good or writes a lot about Hashimoto's with the Hashimoto's protocol. So I started reading things and I tried a lot of different things to find what works for me. And I realized that the biggest thing for me, I was quite addicted to sugar and mm. it had, I had a lot of gut issues because of that, you know, so that was the first thing that had to go. From then, I think once I removed the sugar and I got past the withdrawals, after a few weeks, I actually really started to see that I felt better and I was a little bit more clear headed. It definitely didn't happen overnight. <laughs> it was yep. definitely a process, you know, and there are things that I've tried. People have told me, try this. And I tried it. It didn't work for me. But sugar and uh, processed foods for me were the, like have been the biggest change. What are some information, resources or even groups that you uh, would recommend other people maybe at the start of their autoimmune disease mm. journey um, that they look into, maybe maybe if it's specific to Hashimoto's or even Lyme. For both Hashimoto's and Lyme, there is an international community called Health Unlocked. Um, if you just Google Health Unlocked, it'll come up. That to me was such a source of strength and information. There is other people who've gone through what you've gone through, you can go and like say, guys, I'm having these symptoms. Or if you like me, you're going through a process where you're not, you're not being believed by your doctor. They can help you. So they can point you maybe in the direction of where you can get private tests done cost effectively, or they can help you with how to actually go back to your doctor and because they do have to give you that care and mm -hmm. get them to give you the blood tests or whatever needs to happen. So that's been a really, really great resource. Um, the Lyme Disease Association is also really, really good if you want to know anything to do with Lyme disease, where you can get help, all those kind of things, reading materials. I mentioned Isabella Wentz, um, Hashimoto's Protocol. That's a really, really good book as well, because she really goes into how you can reverse your symptoms through um, diet and mindfulness. Awesome. So my last question is, how can people follow you on your journey? Any social media, websites? My Instagram is at mansmilly, M-A-N-D-S-M-I-L-L-I-E. I also have a blog, which is amandamilly.com, where I blog about health, lifestyle, and anything in between. Well, I really appreciate you being here with us, Amanda. I'm sure a lot of people will resonate with your story. Come back and join us anytime. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me.